Let's talk about the institution of ballet for a minute. So ballet, obviously, having been around for some centuries, it's fair to say that it's an institution at this point. And, and we kind of, it, it seems to be broken up into two separate institutions, which in reality, they're not separate at all. So you have the education side of it, the schools, the academies, conservatories, that kind of thing. And then you have the companies, the professional companies, right? Where they put together performances and that kind of thing. So let me start by saying this. Institutions produce the behavior that they reward. This is all institutions, okay? Institutions produce the behavior that they reward. So when you see, you know, bad behavior or in some cases horrific behavior, and you see all these very negative features that are part of the professional ballet world and the educational part of it, it's the same thing as how I'm going to describe it. It's one thing. Somewhere in the wiring of this institution, there's a reward somewhere. Probably not possible to pinpoint exactly what it is and where it is and how that functions, or at least very difficult to do so. But what I can say for certain is it, is it all originates from the education. That's where it all begins. <clears throat> and this is true for anything, any education, any institution, on any subject. So how to deal with it? That's really the question that I'm here to answer, is how to deal with that. So we've got these institutions, and they more or less function similarly around the world of ballet, although there are some, some differences, some key features that are different in Europe, let's say, as compared to America. But how do we go about addressing the things that we want to change, which is quite a few, actually, in my view, and they're fundamental. So what you see on stage is entirely manifest from the education. Whether it's a lack of education, or it's an incorrect education, or it's a great education, that's what you're going to see on stage 100% of the time. So that is where we address all the issues that are downstream, is education. And that's why I'm, you know, focusing so much of my time and energy on this. It's, it's not that, look, I would love to just hire dancers, create ballets and ballet films and have a good time. We would all like to do that. And it seems like in America especially, that's just what we've done. We just say, well, you know, for example, let's use Balanchine. In, early on in the 20s, he said a very important phrase, first a school. First a school, because he came from that tradition in, it was Imperial Russia, it wasn't the Soviet Union yet, and Vaganova hadn't done anything yet, and it was a school that had a variety of different teachers, Italian and French and, and Dutch and so forth, and Russian. First a school, and he was ignored, or what have you, there's no money, you know, all the things that happened. So the mistake was to start a performing company, New York City Ballet, without establishing the education first. And this is why we see all the things that you've seen over the past who, who knows how many decades. All of those unpleasant features are the result of not having established the curriculum in a school first. And it's not just a curriculum, but it's not just the technical pedagogical stuff, it's the whole philosophical underpinning of what ballet education is. And I'm going to say something people aren't going to like. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm sticking to America because this is my country and this is what it is. Not to say that this isn't true elsewhere, but we don't understand what ballet is fundamentally in this country. We never have because we never established that in the beginning, right? And I think Boroshnikov had the same challenge. I think he brought up the same point. Okay, so he is director of ABT many years ago. And he goes, okay, but we need a school. But not, and not any school. It needs to be this precise, correct curriculum that he came from. Again, no, for whatever reason. No money. And a, but I think what was not understood, and he was not listened to, clearly. Look, I'm going to say this. I don't, I don't think Baryshnikov failed at all at ABT. It seems to me that he gave everything he possibly could. He, he didn't even take a salary. He raised a ton of money. And they just didn't listen to him. They didn't listen to him. 
I don't get listened to. So, you know, this is just a feature of American Ballet. We just want to just do it, do the fun bit, without addressing the real serious issue of education. So yet again, another person, me, trying to address this seriously with the ballet world here, or the community, American Ballet, for that is what I'm focusing this on, but it's relevant elsewhere too. So how do we write this institution? How do we course correct? So the first step is we have to be able to talk about it publicly. We have to be able to have this conversation out in the open so that everybody understands what's going on. And this is where there's tremendous resistance to this, right? And, and now there's even more resistance than there ever was as a consequence probably of me working with a famous person. So now there's this all kinds of pushback. And what's tragic about it is I don't have a personal need to, uh, or some desire to impose my will somewhere. I, I don't want to do that at all, frankly. I would just like to create ballets and film and that kind of thing and just get on with the task of art because I do have this knowledge. I know how to coach and, and teach and create great dancing, right? And in the choreography that, that comes from that. I'm sharing it because it's necessary. It's necessary if ballet is going to exist for even the next, let's say, 20 years, much less 50, right? Because ballet companies are very vulnerable. They're very, very vulnerable, uh, mostly in, in, the, in the financial sense, because their the repertoire is still filled with these old ballets, really old ballets, and the new ballets aren't much better than the old ballets. They're still just either simple-minded in the storyline or it's just a jumbled mess of steps and it looks like this. You know, you can't actually really see the pure dancing and the acting and the idea. It's just a bunch of running around and flipping and flopping. And audiences aren't coming. That's just what it is. People vote with their money. It doesn't matter what they say online, oh, beautiful, wonderful. No, they vote with their money. So they're in a very vulnerable position. And my thinking is maybe that would open their minds to some suggestions, to some ideas of like, let's course correct, because it's not that difficult to do at this point, from my perspective. Placement needs to be integrated into the curriculum of the schools in America and all over the world. And it's, it's, it's a pretty very, it's a straightforward adjustment, let's call it that. It's an adjustment at the fundamental level. And that can be plugged in everywhere where the children, uh, the teenagers, professional dancers, it can be plugged in everywhere. I've demonstrated this already in New York, how quickly this can happen. Um, because frankly with Misty, it was really about three or four months of really consistent work, and that's what led to the result. Before that and after that, it's touch and go. But there was this solid period of time, and, and that's as long as it took, right? So this is a very efficient thing to do. Now I'll caution one thing because I see this happening and it's, it's a natural thing. I understand people are trying to figure some of this out from the podcasts and, and other things. It's what I have done with this placement method of mine is to, I can present it in a way that doesn't unload the complexity of it onto you or the school or whomever. Pedagogically speaking, it's very complex. The math that has to go on to solve these puzzles in our bodies is complicated. That's why I've been at it for 20 years. It's very complicated. So, but the idea why I took on this task is so that I can, I did all the math. The math is done. The problem is solved, right? The, the injury prevention, all of those things are solved already. It's a question of now deploying that method wherever it is wanted, I suppose. I mean, it's needed everywhere, and I think everybody understands that at this point. It's needed. It's just a question of, I don't know how vulnerable ballet companies have to get to where their directors and board of directors decide, yeah, let's go ahead and implement this thing. I don't know. They may just collapse and go away before that happens. I don't know. It's not up to me. But So what I'm capable of doing here is to deliver a method that is sustainable forever while, um, like I said, not unloading the complexity to those who need to learn it. So even teacher to teacher, so if I'm training teachers or coaches, 
they don't need to see all of the math, right? They just need to understand how to use it. And that's the difference. So there's, there's like different categories in my mind, this is how I think about it, of teaching teachers, let's say. So, and I've said something like this before a couple of years ago. So there's teachers who, and coaches, it's the same thing, who teach the dancers or coach the dancers, right? Then there's the teachers who teach teachers how to teach and coach the dancers. And there's a third level, and that is sort of the science level where it's, it's the person or people who create the curriculum who they then teach the teachers who teach the teachers who coach and train dancers. So what this method is, Conrad Placement Method, is the science level where you, you just, I don't need to burden everyone with all of it. I can just teach you how to use it. And then of course, you, you know, the, the, every company and every teacher and every director will take it in the direction they want to take it in based on what styles they want, what kind of choreography they want. That's what this is. So to, to kind of go back to the original idea of institutions produce the behavior that they reward, we need to change the incentives. And we probably need to add some deterrence. So in terms of getting the bullshit people out of ballet is not that hard. You basically just need to set a standard of professionalism. This is what it means to be a professional. Everything below that line is somebody who is working to become a professional. And the idea with this method and the institute is to make that affordable. So those who want to do it absolutely get access to the information that they need. And if they're willing to do the work and do the thinking, then they get it. And this is also how you weed out, uh, you know, like I said, the bullshit people or people that don't want to do the work. Because even with my um, containing the complexity, it's still a lot of work and thinking that goes into being able to do this as a, as a profession. And so all you do is just set the standard. Well, you, and, and it's, and the standard isn't a written, there's no point to give written tests in ballet exams. I don't even understand why that would happen. You just demonstrate, you have the, the, the teacher or the student teacher or the choreographer or the coach demonstrate the work. You just give them a, a task, right? This is what I did in Russia. They just say, pick some dancers and create something. That's your choreography exam. And they would give some um, details of what they wanted to see, music and everything. And I did it and that's it, that's what happened. Or teach this subject or coach, you know, solve this technical problem with this dancer and they just step back and, you know, see if you can do it. So that is how I'm structuring this thing. It's, there's no written test. This makes no, no sense at all. But what I'm doing is, is it will, it's qualification. So there'll be a several of them, right, where teachers will come or what have you, work with the material online and then we start to find way to get to work in person and then the exams are just going to be show me what you got, show me your students, show me what you're doing, and then help, and, and this is how this works. So it'll be a qualification. I don't like certifications. I don't think degrees are necessary. It doesn't mean anything if it's not based on the ability to do the job. That's it. If you can do the job, you know, it doesn't have to be precise, completely precise in the beginning, but you're on the right track, right? And this is how this plan would roll out. So, we have to make these adjustments if ballet is to sustain itself in the coming decades because I just think otherwise it won't. Because there's just too many injuries, too many problems, too much expense, too much wasted money and time and resources everywhere and I just can't see it surviving. And this to me would be tragic. You know, we, ballet needs to, to remain in the world, I think. There's a role for it to play in culture and it has just completely lost track. I mean, culture has just gone on its way and ballet is still stuck in 150 years ago. And we need to make adjustments in the way we view it, philosophically, intellectually, you know, socially, that there has to be levels of professionalism every which way, and it's not difficult to define those things. So we define it, which I've, I'm doing and have done, and then we set the education up and make it affordable for everyone, and this is one step to how we do it. And so I, either an individual person is willing to work the program and attain that professional qualification, or they're not and they don't, and then that's that. Go do something else, right? So, something to think about. Institutions produce the behaviors that they reward. And if the incentives are wrong, if we don't get the incentives right, 
nothing right can come from it. And this is where I end up clashing uh, or, or colliding with the various uh, people is I know what is true and correct in ballet, all sides, pedagogically, creatively, everything. Uh, even, even organizationally, like how to put an organization together. And what kind of person would I be if to know what is true and correct and then choose untrue and incorrect? What person would I be a shitty person? This is something I'm not willing to do, right? So I understand what is true and correct and this is what I'm sharing with everyone who also wants to uh, move ballet forward, which I think we all want to do. See, th there's a concept that I, I want to finish on right here is that there is a situation that we can create, the circumstances where everybody wins because everybody else is winning. You understand? It's not to sound like a politician, but it's, it's the situation where and why I'm doing this. If you succeed and you succeed and you succeed and you succeed as a result of, or to some extent as a result of what I provided, then I succeed, right? So we all succeed here. So, it, and I, I can't seem to get people to believe me when I say I'm not about opening up a school or any other organization for that matter to compete with the existing structure of schools in America especially. There's already enough ballet schools, there's already enough companies, so why not focus on making the adjustments fundamentally and improving all of these existing organizations and institutions? This is where I'm at. Now obviously if that doesn't happen, well then I have to make different choices. But my intention is to make sure everyone has what they need so they can succeed, therefore I can succeed and we're all good together in this. That, that's where I'm headed anyway. It's a question of the ballet world or community is going to believe that or not. And this leads to my one last final point. There's this, there's this funny thing that ha has happened and um, it's in America where, where this has happened. Elsewhere I haven't had this issue at all. It's this idea that I've become, and especially recently, this sort of, um, to coin a Harry Potter phrase, is he who must not be named kind of person. That everybody understands that I'm here and what I'm doing just nobody wants to say my name, that this is where they're getting these ideas from or this, these, this vocabulary from of how to describe ballet. Because once you can describe it, you can start to understand it. And this is just, it's puzzling to me, so I, you know, I find it a little bit funny. So I'm gonna let you guys vote on this. So there's three names, it's Lord Voldemort, whatever, and Harry Potter, you know, when you have kids, you watch that kind of thing. So they, they call him, uh, I, I like one in particular, they call him, well, so it's he who must not be named, uh, you know who, which I, I like, and then the Dark Lord. It's like, look, I, I really don't understand what this is, but there is something between me and reaching everybody else in America. But like, there's something there, there's a, I don't even know what, how to describe it because nobody comes out and tells me. It's just these signals and these hints that I see in various places. and. You know, this, this, this unwillingness or inability to just say my name, to say this is who these ideas come from and refer back to where they come from. There's people using my language and using techniques because as I've said before, I recognize it on stage. Like with this last season I watched, I mean obviously Misty is one thing I worked individually, but I see that the court of ballet and the soloists are starting to do some interesting things. So the message is getting through to some extent, small details, but I, I recognize it like you would recognize your own handwriting. I see it. Okay, I understand what I'm looking at and that these ideas originate not completely from me. Obviously they go back to 100 years ago, but this incarnation of, this, of these ideas, I see it. So why don't, can't we take the next step and just name that this is the method and this is who it comes from and let's all get on the same page. This is a mystery. Maybe someone can tell me.